Okay, are we ready, ladies? Sure. Okay, it's 4, 4.30, so we're gonna get going. I wanna thank everybody out in the audience in person and those of you online. My name is Lynn Fitch, I'm the county clerk for Sawyer County. And this is our first training that's, uh, I think, been a big group in a long time, so we're thrilled that you're here. We're gonna, we have uh, Patty Swafield and Bryn Williamson, who are going to do our presenting for us. I'm just going to be running the show as far as moving the screens up and down. If you're online and you have questions, could we wait until the end for anyone to ask questions from both the in-person audience and on Zoom, just so that we can keep our presentation moving and then they can hold those questions, write them down, and we'll get back to you. How's that sound? Okay, we're ready. All right. I'm going to start with absentee voting. The town of Hayward has a ridiculous amount of absentee requests. Um, just a little perspective, in the last general election, we had 2,097 votes cast. Of that, 1,330 were absentee. So that's a lot of absentee ballots. <laughs> but we hopefully have cut it down a little bit. We just sent out letters to all of our indefinitely confined and calendar year people to say, are you really indefinitely confined? Because if they don't send, what is it? Send a ballot back, then we send a letter. Um, I can't remember which election. I think general election. The general. So like at this one, they all did, but we sent a letter at the beginning of this year, just, and a lot of people did change their request. I think with COVID, many people just said, send me a ballot for all the elections from now on. So we did try to condense it a little bit. Anyway, so right now we have about 200 voters that will automatically receive a ballot for all of this term. And the town of Hayward keeps track of our own ballot requests in WIS vote. I know each township does it differently. So some of you are sending your requests to Lynn and some of you keep track yourself. Uh, the number one thing is um, that the ballot request has to be made in writing. So I know you see people on the street, oh, can you send me a ballot for this election? write it down. They have to write it down and give you that request. I mean, I get Facebook messages. Can you send me a ballot? Because I know you. So I have made it like you have to send me an email, write it down and drop it off because I need your photo ID and the request in writing. The simplest way is to say, go to my vote. So if you're registered, have the voter go to my vote and make the request right there. And they also must always provide a copy of their photo ID unless they've got it on file with you. So once they give it to you at one time, the clerk, it's on file, you don't have to ask for it again. And then once all of that information is in with vote, um, you, the clerk, automatically receives that information and you have one business day to send out the ballot. So once you get the request, whether it's by email or in with vote, you have one business day to process that and send the ballot out. Number one, make sure the voter is already registered because you can't send them a ballot if they're not. So then go through that whole process of registering them if they are not. Preparing and mailing the ballots. Um, make sure that you initial the ballot because if you send out a ballot that's not initialed, once it comes back, you can't count it. Prepare the inner and, em and outer envelopes. Are you guys familiar with these? This is the inner, I just call them the inner and outer. This is the one that comes, goes to the voter and the one that comes back to the clerk. And both need postage, addresses, and return addresses. I don't need anybody like I used to, you know. No. Well, I was in the post shop. Uh, okay, they're muted. Okay, Britton, are you, are you working off of any handout at the moment? I am the first one, the absentee voting handout. Sorry, I should have told let you me, that. Let me see what that one looks like. Okay, let me find that on here. I think it was towards the bottom. Okay. That's the third one in, I think. Third and fourth one in. So when we were doing, you know, thousands of these, it was quite the station. <laughs> but you always want to make sure that you have the clerk's return address on this one so that it's easy for them to just send their ballot back to you and as a clerk you have to provide postage I know in the past other 
townships weren't. We always have, but it is actually state statute that you have to provide return postage for these ballots to come back to you. So you prepare the envelopes and you can, I mean, because some, some ballots are more confusing than others and you can type up something with additional instructions and stick it in there. If, if you think that that would help the voter, you don't have to do that. And also make sure that if you have like a husband and wife, you can't send them a, two ballots in one envelope, but everything has to be separate. And then also make sure that you check the mailing address. I know in the town of Hayward, we have a ton of people that winter down south. And if you just go off of their voter address without checking to make sure that they don't have a different address for their ballot, then it takes a lot longer if there's you know, then they don't get to vote or if there's issues with it, it takes a lot longer for it to get to and from. So make sure you check that mailing address. Um, I think that's it for sending them out. Most of you don't have like thousands to do, so it's not that difficult, right? <laughs> Any more to new handout? Say what? New, new handout? No, same handout, okay. just processing the returned ballots. Um, ballots, so you can mail them out and the voter does not have to mail them back. They can either mail them back or drop them off. And I'm sure most of you have a drop box at your town hall. Is that accurate? Um, so I like it when they are mailed just because there's the documentation, the postage, but we know what our mail is like. So a lot of people put them in our drop box and I make sure that I write the date that it was returned just so I have. Bryn? Yep. That, um, the drop box right now can be used up through the April election and they may, that may change. There's a, a new ruling gonna go through that the drop boxes will be canceled. Okay. But that's not a definite rule. So um, through April, you can use through the drop April, box. For sure, okay. Mm -hmm. Good to know, because I kind of like the Dropbox. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a good thing to have. Um, otherwise, I, I do have people just drop them off to me so that they're not dealing with the mail because we've had a lot of people, oh, I sent it two weeks ago and it still hasn't been returned. So don't rely on the mail. But anyway, um, so then once you receive the ballot back, make sure that you record in WISVOTE, if you're doing WISVOTE yourself, the date that it was returned, or make sure you get that information to Lynn. Do not open the ballots, but do look over. So you will receive this envelope, the sealed ballot inside, and make sure that everything is filled out. The voter must sign the envelope, and the voter's witness and witness address must be on the envelope. If any of those things are missing, you can still fix it. So I've tracked down many, many voters, and I've actually driven to people's houses to have them sign it just <laughs> because I want their vote to count. But you can contact them and say, hey, this is missing. How can we fix it? Whether they come to you. Um, they say that the, like if it's missing a witness and they, have, they, they did have a witness watch them, that person can come with them to your office and sign it in front of you. So there are ways to fix these things. So that's make sure that you check it as soon as you get it in so that you have time to fix those mistakes and that their vote counts. And yeah, I think like last with all of those ballots that we had last year, we didn't reject one for any of this missing information. We were able to fix every single mistake or you know little error. Are there any questions about that stuff before we talk about the in-person voting? And that was probably confusing because some of you poll workers don't do anything with the absentee ballots, but. I'd like to add too that um, the election commission said that if the clerk knows the witness, um, they, that clerk can put their address on the envelope instead of having that person come in and, and have the witness come in. And that's just if the address is missing. If, if the address is yeah. missing, but they have to have their signature. I mean, there's no, no two ways about it. Yep. Anything? So 14 days prior to the election, you can have in-person absentee voting, which many people still call early voting, which I think confuses people, but <laughs> it does. Um, so some voters choose to come to your office to do their absentee voting ahead of time. And it's basically the same system. Um, I, I know you don't have to do this, but for paperwork's sake, I do this application. If you guys are familiar with it, I don't think we have it 
in our stuff, but it's the EL-121, and it's just the absentee ballot application request. I have the voter fill that out in my office so that I have it because I print the labels. They don't have to fill out this part of the envelope. Do any of you fill our print out labels for the envelopes with the voters information? Because that's a lot easier. I know if you don't, you should learn how to do it because it saves a lot of time. <laughs> Get a Dymo printer. Yeah, it works really good. It's like magic. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so you can, I did talk with the Elections Commission. This counts as the application, so they don't have to do this. But I think we've just done it, always done it this way. And then if they don't have photo ID, I attach the photo ID and we file this. So we have it on file because you won't keep these forever. You know what I mean? These will go to the county after this election, but this can stay in your office so that you always have their information. And the, the photo ID should be stapled to the registration. Yeah. So you'll always have it. And I actually, I probably make too much work for myself, but I have both the photo ID on their yeah, absentee too, too application and their registration, just so that we have it on we file. Have <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here. So the person will come in to vote. And like I said, I haven't filled this out just because then I can enter if I get it. Because during the big elections, I'll have 25 plus people vote in one day in my office. So I don't get them all entered in the system as they're sitting there. So then I can take this form, enter it into WISP vote, print the label, and then we're good to go with the filing. But um, you just have them fill out the paperwork, get their photo ID if you don't have a copy, give them a place to vote, let them vote, put their ballot inside the envelope, and if they're with, say, their husband or wife, they can witness each other's, or you can be the witness. But remember, as the clerk, you have to put your address too, which I didn't realize that until sometime yeah. last year. Yeah, you do. And it's your home address, not your clerk's address. I mean, you have to fill it out as a witness. Um, let's see. So the, the in-person voting is basically the same exact way as mail, except obviously it's not going through the mail. So we file all of ours together and keep all of the ballots in a locked vault until election day, uh, because then you need to record those, all of this information into your poll books. So for most of you, it's not gonna be hundreds of absentees and it's not a big deal. Um, our last election, we took the Monday before the election and we had, what, seven people come in to process and get everybody written into the poll books so that we were ready for election day. Um, but normally you can do this on election day because you cannot open your ballots. These cannot be opened until 8 p.m. on election day. So remember that, that you can't start processing anything until after the polls close on election day. Um, anyway, to process the... No. Yes. You can do those during the day. The election day, you can open those envelopes during the day. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. You can now. Yeah, you don't have to wait until later. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. But you, you got to wait until election day. You can't open them until then. I think it was the April election, and then in that madness, they told us we could not. Yeah, yes, I, don't, I don't remember. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a yeah, that's from right. last year. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, this is Kathy Overman. Is there any way you can turn up the volume? We can't hardly hear it all, and I'm glad you're recording it because I'll request it because we can't hear. Okay. Um, I'll see if my folks and our IT person can be reached. Or talk, talk closer. Talk to louder. The, closer. Closer to the microphone. I'm sorry. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Is that better, Kathy? <laughs> can you hear me? Kathy? It's better, but... If you can talk louder, it would be appreciated. I'm not the only one. Someone else chatted as well. Okay, thank you. Can you hear that? Yeah, that's better, but it's still quiet. I, I don't know how else we're going to do it. I don't either. <laughs> well, at least you're louder. Before, it was like you were whispering. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll, yell, <laughs> we'll yell into the microphone. Okay, I'll yell. Thank you. No, thank you. Okay, so when you get your envelopes, you will need um, your poll books. So this can be done, like I said, if you do have a lot of ballots, you can do this before the election once you print your poll books, or this can be done on election day. 
So you need your, your poll workers that will have each have a poll book and a third person to read the name of the voter on the absentee ballot envelope and um, make sure that you are using red ink when you assign that voter number. So you would mark that number in red and like this example here, 45A and the A is for absentee. So that's just a way to keep track of your absentees in the poll book. And at this point, you can still, so you have multiple people looking at these, still look it over and make sure everything is correct because if anything is missing on the certification, you still have time to fix it. Anything to add to that, Patty? I don't think so. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so you have until 8 p.m. that on election day to fix any of these mistakes. So if somebody doesn't have time to bring in a witness or something, but they can come in, you can spoil this ballot and they can vote in person. I mean, that, that is one option because your goal is to make sure that every vote counts. Yes. Um, I, yes, because you have be. to have an odd number of people and then one for each poll book. Yep. And then the third person is not only reading the name, we have them write the number on the ballot envelope as well. So. Yes, yeah. it, that's but, not. That's on, not on the envelope, not the ballot, because you're not looking at the ballots at, yeah, at this point. That's not required, but um, if your town wants to do it that way, that's perfectly fine. But it's not required to put the number on the on the uh, return envelope. Right. But in the poll book, yeah, two two poll books, and one person reading the name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can miss things that way. You know, and just uh, for for volume's sake, if you are having a hard time hearing, I've been advised by IT that our volume is good, but maybe it's your speakers that are not turned up at your site. So check your personal speakers to make sure volume is up on your end. Sure. Well, you can't throw anything out. So you would keep it and you would write on here rejected or yeah, I think you would say rejected and which like which number of the day. So it'd probably be, you know, rejected number one and make sure you write that on the inspector statement. And then just make sure you keep that and turn that in. And I always document names. So it rejected this voter name and the reason why, because that inspector statement is your Bible <laughs> for later on when you're like, oh, why did we do that? So just make sure you document and then keep, yep, keep it. And this year um, I, I created some envelopes with instructions for spoiled ballots and rejected ballots. So you'll have instructions right on the envelopes that you're gonna use to turn in. So that's gonna be a new perfect. part of the process. I, I don't know. I think if you've already processed the absentee ballot, and you've written the number in the poll book, they can't, no, it's, it's no, a done deal. No, not once they've, it's count, like you've processed it. Yeah, once you've counted it. But if you've gotten to this point that you're gonna assign a number, and, yeah. and you're, then you and realize they they're come missing in, something, if so they if come it's in before you. you've assigned the number, after, they, they can't. And also, I mean, even like if a person just says, hey, I wanna change my vote. Once they've turned this into you, whether you've, written anything down in the poll books or not, they voted. They can't change anything. So the only time that you can do that change is if the certification isn't correct and you're just trying to make sure that it, their vote counts. But like if somebody just says, I want to change my vote or, you know, I, I think I did something wrong. It's, sure. Okay. Because she wants to put it where she's going to, after she's voted, she's going to 
So you're saying she's coming in on election day? Yeah. And they. And, but she wants to put her vote where she wants to put her vote, but then does she keep that absentee envelope? Or do we take that envelope? I don't get your question. She, yeah. Do you send her an absentee ballot? Yes. Okay, and then she brings it in on, on yeah. election day, yeah. and then she wants to put it in the bo ballot box, is what you're saying? No, no, they, no, she no, shouldn't no, do no, that because no. it should still be sealed. Nope. Yep. When she, when she brings it in, it should be sealed and then given to you for you to do all the proper steps of recording. Otherwise, spoil the absentee ballot and, and she then can she give can her vote. a new ballot and let her vote that yep. way. Okay. Yep. No, well, now you can tell her. <laughs> tell her. Can't do that. No. No. Okay. no. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see, where are we at here? Um, so once you have hey. recorded all of the names in your poll books and you've determined that this uh, envelope is all of the certification is sufficient, then the envelope can be opened. I don't know about you guys, but because vote, like the names, that part is public. So your observers can listen to you say, so-and-so number 45, but the vote is not public, that is private. So I make sure that my workers open the envelopes without looking, you know, we put, so that's why you wanna make sure everything is good to go before you start opening because once it's opened, you don't know whose ballot is attached to what envelope. You don't want to know. So you open it, put the ballot here, envelope here, separate it, because then once you take those ballots to put them in the tabulator, you don't want to know how your people voted, right? So just, that, I mean, that's something that I make sure that the voters do because, and since you're in charge, you can say, tell them that. And if there's people that, you know, like the whole goal of wanting to work and open things is because they want to see how people voted, move them to a different assignment <laughs> because we shouldn't be looking at how people are voting. So yeah, remember elections. how a person votes is private. So just remember that when you're opening those ballots. So you can separate the ballots from, now, so is this is wrong then? We can put them in the tabulator throughout the day. Okay. Yeah, at one point during last year's elections, I think the state told me that we had to wait. There was one election and I think the poor county had to wait for our what results until like midnight. <laughs> so yeah, throughout no. the day, you can feed them through the tabulator now. Does that make sense? I'm probably Who did not Any questions there? This is okay. And I think that's all of the absentee voting. Enough. So if there's any questions on any of the paperwork or the process, let us know before we move on. How about the Zoom people? Do you have any questions? They can't hear us? Yes, yes they can. OK. <laughs> no questions then. Okay. Moving on to um, so we're moving on to voting machine testing. And I think currently we all have different machines. <laughs> so we're not going to do specifics of voting machine testing, but does anybody still use the touch screen? You do. We're in which hand? So you don't want that. Um, we are on one. Okay. Sorry. Just let me know when you start. But she was. Uh, yes, if, if there's anyone that's not asking a question on Zoom, could you just mute again? We, so I don't, we, we don't have a handout for this one. Sorry, just to confuse you. <laughs> <The new> <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> 
the new as equipment, you're all searching frantically. <laughs> yeah, the new equipment should be arriving soon for those that don't have their new ICE or ICX. I've been in touch with Command Central and they've assured me that they feel there's all but three machines here. And if those three machines don't come in, they will provide loaner machines to make sure we get through the April election. It's like the town of Hayward, we still have six edge touch screens and then the old school tabulator. So we're waiting on one of those machines. And I don't know what you have, but we all have. We have an ICE now, which is brand new to me. I'm still learning. But basically the machines, you want to make sure when the, when the uh, memory cards or the cartridges come in that you do your pre-lat testing. And when you do your pre-lat testing, do every scenario you can think of. Make sure that um, if there's an overvote that it, it's checking for overvotes. If it's, um, uh, what was some of the other things? The write-ins, yeah. yeah, the write-ins or yeah, on the tabulators, if there's a mark, it's not, it's, it, it'll reject it and you want to know why. Um, vote for a, a several people several times so you know that it's adding up properly. Mm -hmm. Don't just put a couple uh, ballots through the yeah, machine. Yeah, try everything. And Do then as when much as you can. Feeding so, them into the machine, try every direction to prove that it's... Yeah, upside down, upside down, crinkle it up, do whatever. The touch screen, um, that's a little simpler there because it won't let you overvote. Um, if you do a write-in, it won't let you, that's all it'll let you do is just a write-in, right, Ed? I can't remember anymore. <laughs> it's been two years since I used it. <laughs> so um, they're, they're a little easier. But, and then once the public test comes, do the same thing with the public test because it's, it's a separate cartridge or separate memory card. Um, the touch screen, I call them cartridges. And then the other we machines, have, have I call it memory card. Yeah. So that's the difference. Yes? Oh, the, for the, the, the tabulator? Ice machine, the ice machines are, are separate, uh, different than what the touch screen has. Yeah. They're, they're bigger. And then the, the memory cards. And what we're going to see for this April election, because District 12 Supervisor Dawn Pettit, uh, her district did not get any candidates. So there's already two registered writings for that district. There may be another I've heard. So at that point in time, I will send you a list of registered write-in voters. You cannot post that list but you can t tell people their names if they ask if there's a registered write-in. So on that night, because there's no names on the ballot, anyone running and gets a write-in vote gets counted. It's a lot more work. Oh, goody. Okay. <laughs> so, so after, when you're done with the public test, make sure that you, um, well, it's probably even before that, when the pre lat make sure that you put your seal where the card, the memory card or the cartridge is going and that stays on there until the elections are all, all over with. And that needs to be um, notated either on an inspector statement or on a um, log. Let's see, where is it? I've made up my own seal log. You can do that and because you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to note every seal number that you use for every different scenario has to be on a log somewhere, either be on your own log or be on the inspector statement. But the biggest thing is make sure you put the tab, which is, they're yellow, green, or red. I'm not sure all the different colors. These are your little tabs. And um, that has to go on where the memory devices are going. Bef right, I think right after the pre lat once your cartridges are put in there. And that's about it for that. Just but just to make testing. sure that you do the public test. That's number one. Yeah, and I think the public test, I think it's uh, mandatory, I think, to have it posted in the paper. Yes. So make sure you do that too. And you can have, like we have, um, I tell some of the election workers, you know, if they're not familiar with the machines, that's a good time for them to come and watch what's, you know, and, and to see, because sometimes people aren't sure what's on the ballot and stuff as far as your workers. So they'll come into the public test and then they're familiar with the machine and the ballot and they're ready for election day. Yeah.
you so, should have more than one person there. Yeah. So the but question was, chief and I've inspector. Been, you don't no. need the whole crew, no. no. But uh -uh. Patty and Bryn, if a question gets asked of the audience, would you mind just repeating, repeating? it because okay. they have a hard time hearing from the audience? Oh yeah. The the question was, can the clerk just do the public test by him or herself? And the answer is no. There should be at least one more person with them doing it. Okay. Okay. Okay, the Let's next see. thing. Uh, oh, that's Bryn again. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky me. Um, poll worker and chief inspector training. So, how many of you are poll workers? Sweet. How about chief inspectors? And then, how about clerks? Well, this section is for you guys because this is the poll worker stuff. Um, so let's see, what are we on form-wise? Form that, that'll work. Oh, just that first page here. Yep. Um, just a quick chief or regular election inspectors, your training is up to your clerk. So um, basically what I have that I'm doing is the stuff that I give my poll workers, but each clerk can determine the amount of training and exactly what you're doing. Uh, the chief inspector is more specific. You have to have baseline training, which is through um, WEC, the Elections Commission, and it's a two-hour baseline, and then you have to have six hours in a two-year term, but the regular poll workers, it could be just two hours during that term, so it's kind of up to your chief or your clerk. I don't know how Patty does it, but probably similar. Um, one thing I can add is that when you, if you come in and do a prelat or a public test, that counts as training once during the year. Yep. Let's see, so we've got this form. So this is just a very simplistic form of the duties. Um, this is kind of, I think I have Town of Hayward on here because like I said, I used this for my last training of our poll workers. But your duties are pretty simple. Um, setting up the polling place, if some of you come to help ahead of time, otherwise a lot of time I, at the Town of Hayward, it's the clerk and the chief inspector, we set up the polling place, but poll workers are more than welcome to come help ahead of time. Registering voters, issuing ballots, recording voter or votes, who votes, monitoring the election equipment, completing those election day forms, tallying the write-in votes and closing the polls. And I don't have to read through all of this, but um, your qualifications uh, used to be that you had to be a resident of your township. Wasn't that? Only the chief, chief inspector has to be yeah, a resident. Now it's just the chief inspector. And so I think some of you actually, I know live in one township and are gonna be a poll worker for a different one. So that's helpful because sometimes we need poll workers and people in our own township don't wanna work. So you just have to be a resident of Sawyer County and you can work in any township. Let's see. And then you just have to make sure as a regular poll worker that you have some training. So ask lots of questions <laughs> because you might not have, each municipality has different training so you might not get the same training at any, you know, from any clerk, or what Patty provides to her clerks is probably not the same that Britain provides to her clerks. So just ask questions because there's a lot of information out there. So I think that this sheet, the poll worker job stations, if you want to find that one, it's just a brief overview of the various positions that you could get assigned to work on election day. Okay, I'll go up to the front. Okay. 
Sorry, folks. That's okay. There we go. Okay, so poll worker job stations. Um, you won't always need a greeter, but your big elections, it's very helpful to have somebody that's at the front door that can help people ask them, you know, are you registered? If the person is not registered, then the greeter can direct them where to go. And uh, like I said, the, our smaller elections, we typically don't have a greeter because it's pretty self-explanatory. You come in and you go straight to the poll books. But the greeter can um, remind people that they need proof of residency and if they're, if they're registering that day and photo ID if, for when they're voting that day. The poll book workers, you will need two people stationed at your poll books. The first person will ask the voter to state their name and address. And it does not matter if you know these people, you probably know everybody in your township, but they still have to state their name Rick, and address. I'm gonna go through that with the, um, the voter ID. Okay. I'll go through that. So just remember that at that station and she's gonna delve deeper into that. So the, the poll book station, you'll have two people and you ask for the photo ID and that's where the voter will show their ID and then sign the poll book. And I don't, it depends on you know, the, the size of your election, but you will also need people. Sometimes we have three people sitting at one table. So two people are working the poll books and this third person and the middle poll book worker will issue the paper ballots. Just as long as you have two people issuing paper ballots and two people working the poll books, it, you know, sometimes we don't have 15 people to choose from for election workers, but these are the, what you need. So when the people issue the ballots, both poll workers need to initial the ballots. You can't just have one. Um, machines, I guess this is kind of obsolete because most of us are veering away from the machines, but we, I think the town of Hayward will still have one touch screen for the next couple of elections until we're good to go with our new one. Uh, so we just have one person that's stationed at the machine so they can push the button to get the machine ready for the next voter and is there to answer questions if the voter has any questions about the machine. And also change the paper, because that's a really fun job. And the tabulators, which most of us are going to, will ha you should have a person stationed at the tabulator to either help the voter feed the ballot in or they, you, they can hand it to you and you can do it or you just be there in case there's any issues, but you, we need to have a person there, just like you would if it was the um, good old fashioned ballot box. We had to have somebody stationed there to uh, watch the person put the ballot into the box. And the registration table, you need to make sure that you have someone that is on hand all day to help fill out the, what is it, EL 133? EL 131. 131, sorry. <laughs> and, um, I like to have, like we have our big elections out in the fire hall, so I make sure to have our laptop set up out there so we can put it into the computer right then and there because then you, make, you know that it went through, you know that they're registered to vote, they're in the right township because if you just do fill out the paper and then let them go through the line, that's when you know, you're not, if, if they're in the wrong township, you don't know that until after they've already voted. So if you have the capability of ha being able to register them right then and there on election day, in the computer, do that. I don't know if, if you guys all have that capabilities. No, we don't. No? Mm -mm. It's very handy. <laughs> I'm sure it is, but yeah. we don't get that many, so yeah. That's true. Yeah. I suppose we have. We're, we're good. Um, one thing that I like to make sure I let my poll workers know is don't talk about politics on election day. You can talk about anything else as you're sitting there because some elections are very slow and very boring but don't talk about politics. Don't talk about your opinions. And one time we had <laughs> poll workers wearing certain colors, thinking they were being tricky, showing up in all blue or all red. But keep politics out of it, whether it's attire, your conversations, your bumper stickers on your car. So make sure you tell your poll workers this. Poll workers, remember this, because um, I've had people show up and park their car a certain way with bumper stickers, and then I have to ask them to move them. <laughs> so we have to set the example, and 
Some of you are actually probably nominated from a political party, and even at that, we don't care. Don't talk about it. <laughs> you're, you're unbiased, and you're there just to make sure that the whole process works smoothly, and nobody cares how you vote, and we don't care how anyone else votes. So remember that, because that causes issues when you let your politics get involved in the day. Um, yeah, sorry for this piece of paper. It has uh, chief inspectors, but this was our previous training. These aren't even our chief inspectors anymore. But I like to make sure that the, the, all of the poll workers know who's in charge that day. So as clerks, make sure your poll workers know who your chief is because that's who's in charge on election day. It's not the clerk, it's the chief inspector. So if you have any issues, make sure the poll workers know who to turn to. In fact, I have this one sheet here. Who do we call for help on election day? Go to your chief inspector first, if you have any issues. Then next step is your own clerk. The county clerk, you can always pester Lynn. She loves to be bugged on election day, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think, if you wanna write this down, I don't think I had her phone number on that form, but I have it now, so your clerk, you can just make sure that your, your workers know who to turn to. And then the county clerk, Lynn, is 634-4866. And then if you need to go even higher up than that, the Wisconsin Elections Commission is 608-261-2028. And I'll admit that I was nervous to call them at first, but they're wonderful and they will answer any question. And I think we might, so this one. That's the front I, page. The front page of it? Yep. Um, Second page, I think. Really? Yes. Didn't come through. No? Who anyone is unmuted either. Okay. This one I don't have to go over in depth, but I suggest Which that you that read one? it. What was that? Which one's that? Um, your role and responsibility as a poll worker. It's just a little bit more detail of everything that I went over. And one thing I would like to reiterate is that documentation is important. So that inspector statement is your Bible for the day. Um, I know some townships just have the chief inspector right on that. I don't know how you guys do it. Um, at our last training that I went to, they suggested that you have a inspector statement at each station, so like by the poll books. So if there's issues there, it can be written down. I kind of like to have one inspector statement and have the chief inspector keep track of that. But anything, whether you think it's significant or not, if uh, write it down. You know, we learned that like even something as simple as you have candy out for the voters to take a piece of candy when they're done and a little kid takes it and chokes. Write that down just in case anything comes of it later. You have documentation. And it might seem silly, but that's what that inspector statement is there for, is anything that goes on throughout the day, then you have it to look back on. And, you know, whether it's voting, I, I write down well, when the machines, when we changed our paper and, you know, little things like that. Just keep a log of your day so that you have, if any questions are asked later on, you have it right there in front of you. So this one, yeah, I won't go through it, but this has a lot more information about your role as a poll worker. <laughs> she is. <laughs> Are there any questions, any Zoom questions? 
Zoom people. <laughs> <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. I, I sent a question in chat. I don't know if you can see it or not. It's not a question. I'm addressing the issue of incomplete absentee ballot envelopes to be rejected on election day and whether they can be corrected. They can be corrected by 8 p.m., but the voter still has to submit the original contents of that envelope. They can't spoil it and then vote in person. It's still counted as an absentee. They can't re-vote. The only way they can re-vote is if you ask no, them if they return you're saying they can vote in person. She said they could spoil the ballot. They that can't. you you can't spoil the ballot. If they can't been, spoil if, the ballot. If it's been processed already, you cannot spoil the ballot. Correct. Right. No, if it's been mailed. It's considered voted when they mailed it. You. The question yeah, you ask what, them is: what, did, you, <laughs> did you mail it? Sorry. The question you ask them is: did you mail it? Did you put it in the mail? Opinion. And if they if the answer is that they mailed it, then they can't vote. They're out of luck. That's the reason why everyone's so stressed out about returning stuff by mail. Yeah. We just looked it up. It's in the election day manual. It's on page 100 and 101. There's a flow chart. It's not worded very well, so we have to debate it ourselves here, Chris and I. But take a look at that, and that might be something to ask the Elections Commission if, this, if there's still a question mark about this. And we can send that, we can investigate that and send that out in an email to your municipal clerks for clarification. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to mute this now so the dogs don't bark. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's well, we one like more. The dogs. They have an opinion. It's there's Jenny. one more question. Um, can a voter come and vote with a hat or shirt promoting a party? Yes. <sighs> yeah. They can. As long as they leave, as soon as they're done voting, they have to leave the building. Yep. Period. Yeah. A voter can walk through. The whole process, you know, wearing whatever hat, shirt they want, as long as they aren't lingering and talking about the candidate or electioneering is what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, if they just come in to vote and mind their own business and go about their voting process, that's absolutely fine. But when they, if they were to stay and talk about the candidate or anything like that, then you can ask them to, you know, hurry up and vote and leave. Jenny? Yes. Oh. In that case, yes, yes, that case, yes, they can. They, yes, yep, yep. Could you repeat? The I've had that happen too? before too. Yes. Yep. Yep, and that would be another case where you document on your. Um, this question was, or statement that, you know, if a ballot is, has been mailed out, but has not come back to you, the clerk, um, the, the voter has had, had been watching and noticed that the ballot never made it back to the clerk's office. So that person came in and voted in person and that can be done. And then just document that, that, that the ballot you vote, you sent out never made it back. And then this person voted in person. Did they vote in your office or on election day? Um, yep. Okay, just a time check here. We're at 518. Okay, let's go next. <laughs> We're ahead of schedule. Are we? <laughs> yep. Oh. Oh, yeah, two minutes. Judy, did you have something? No, it was Okay. Patty's turn? I don't want any other questions. That's when we were talking about voters coming in with attire, um, a political attire. Yes, they can do that as long as they're not making a scene. Um, the other thing we have, I don't know about you guys, but we have quite a few election observers. And it's the same thing. They can sit and observe all day long and from, you know, whatever organization or party they're with. But uh, at one time we had observers with um, materials set out but it was quite obvious for a political party. So I had to ask them to put that, that stuff away because again, you're just there to observe, not do anything else. Question? Well, 
What was that? It is in the election day manual. It states um, the question was about protesters or anybody like that. It's a um, hundred feet from the door of the uh, election hall, the voting. And actually, in some of our big elections, we've actually measured off a hundred feet because we anticipate people coming and protesting, and we've had them. But anyway, it's a hundred feet from the door, and if you're beyond that, then you can. Have your signs, you can have your wear whatever you want to wear, do your electioneering, but not within that 100 feet from the door. And if they're causing a ruckus outside, call the sheriff. That's all you have to do. Yep. And he'll take care of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any other questions on that subject? Yes. Um, it, aside from, they can't have any political attire. Yep. They shouldn't. That's the observer. I'm sorry. Yep. The question was, can the observers wear anything they want? But uh, no, they can't wear any political attire either. Well, if it's obvious that that's what they're doing, the question was um, about political attire or just wearing like all red or all blue. If it's obvious that they're wearing all red because they're being conservative, then that that's different than just, you know what I mean? Uh, like I said, we had people that were trying to be sneaky that were election workers and they knew exactly what they were doing and I knew what they were doing. So we just had a discussion and they put a shirt on over the top of what they were wearing. It was just kind of goofy. But for the most part, you're not going to see that, I don't think. <laughs> you guys are all lucky because you're not the town of Hayward. We've had we've gone to tabletop things with um, the state and they have all these weird examples of bizarre things that happen during an election and I'm like, oh, that happened in Hayward. Oh, that happened in Hayward. Oh, yeah, we've had that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish our township was smaller. <laughs> Ladies, which handout should I be on now? I think we're moving on to okay, this one. proof of ID and photo or yeah, proof of residence. ID and proof of residence. Okay, we're going to talk about proof of ID first. Bryn already touched on some of this, but I'll go over it again. <clears throat> when somebody comes in to vote, they must state their name and address. I don't care who they are. They could be your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, doesn't matter. They have to state their name and address. Both poll workers will go into the poll books and look to see if their name and address is what they just said it was. If it's not, if they've changed their name, they have to re-register. If they've changed their address, they have to re-register. If everything is okay, um, oh, then, um, oh, one more other thing before I forgot, before I forget. When you're looking at the poll book, look for the watermark that says movers on it. That's because the election commission ha was notified that that person moved. And um, so then ask the voter, have you moved? If they have not moved, just make a notation in the poll book that they have not moved, and then the clerk can get the WIS vote um, uh, fixed, showing that they didn't really move. And that happens, uh, they send out these notices quarterly to people that they, they've got notification that they've moved. Okay, so then um, once everything's okay, then they ask for the ID. Uh, everybody voting in person on election day, including curbside voters, voters um, uh, in the clerk's, if you vote in the clerk's office and first time voter by mail has to show a photo ID. And the only ones that are exempt from that are confidential voters. And here is your photo ID, what, what they can show, what they can give you. Um, make sure that you're familiar with the expiration dates on here. Uh, state of Wisconsin driver's license, I, uh, state ID card, military ID, um, passport, 
Right now, that cannot be expired um, prior to November 30th of 2020. So it has to be unexpired or expired after that date. Um, let's see. Uh, the, if somebody is just getting their new driver's license, uh, that has to be unexpired or uh, valid for, oh, it's valid for 45 days. So it has to be unexpired. So just have this next to you when you when the girls that are checking or the guys that are checking in, have that next to you so you can look at that um, to make sure they give, to, give you something that's legit. And also you can get, have this next to you. Shows all the different IDs that they can have. Patty, on that first sheet where it has a proof of residence and proof of uh, proof of IDs ID. on, the, on the right. Yep. Um, one trainer that I attended suggested folding it in half so you have to flip it each time so that or, you, you know you're only on one part of the page. Or just give the check-in people the, the proof of ID and Excellent. then the register people gets the proof of residence. Correct. So you don't get confused. So, okay, so then I gotta, I gotta make, look at my notes, make sure I don't miss anything. Um, if the voter, okay, once they give you the ID, there's only three things that the, the poll workers look at and both poll workers have to look at this. They're looking at their name, they're looking at their signature and they're look, or, I'm sorry, their expiration date and they're looking at their photo. The name doesn't have to be exactly though it's on the poll book. If, for example, if their, their driver's license says, um, has their middle initial, but the poll book has their middle name, it's okay. Uh, the photo has to look similar to whoever's standing in front of you, front of you hopefully, because <laughs> you know those driver's license photos aren't very good. The expiration date, like I said, on the driver's license especially has to be after November 3rd of 2020. Um, the address does not have to match, so don't even look at that. So once they got, once you looked at the ID, everything's good, they sign the poll book, and then you give them a voter number. Now, is everybody familiar with this voter number? Because I didn't Maybe know about no. it until about a month ago. When somebody comes in to vote, when, once they've signed the, the, vote, the poll book, you give them a number. So let's say number 32 came in. That number needs to match whatever number you're putting next to their name in the poll book. So if number 32 is on the poll book, you give them number 32, then you direct them to the people that are giving out the ballots. They give that number to the person that, giving out the ballots, they get a ballot, and then they, they vote, and then that's the end. We've been doing the numbers for a while in the town of Hayward just because of how many people we have, and it helps with then the people that are issuing the ballots know that this person has made it through the first checkpoint of the poll books, and it also helps you to keep your poll books reconciled yeah. throughout the day because everybody's on the same number, so... It, it, if you're not doing it, it really does help to keep everything going smoothly. Yeah. I don't know how everybody's doing it, but we use, we have all these numbers on a piece of paper and when we assign a number to somebody, we circle it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure most of everybody's doing the same thing. So if number 32 is up, you, know, you circle that, you give them number 32, you put number 32 on the poll book and away they go. If they're unable or unwilling to give you their ID, they have, they may vote provisionally. And then you got to let them know that they got to come in by four o'clock on the following Friday to show their proof of identification. If they don't have identification, then you can direct them to this. <laughs> this is the free way, this is free ID and identification card petition process, kind of a long name. Um, it gives the website on how to, to fill out the paperwork to get an ID from the state. And what it's going to be, it will be these two, one of these forms that they have to fill out. They take it to the DMV. The first one is MV3004. Uh, that's to get a free ID card. 
And the other one, MV3012, is if they do not have proof of their name or if they don't have a birth certificate, they can still get an ID. So these are the forms that need to be filled out. And, and this, by calling this or looking at their video, they'll be able to find out what they have to take with them to the DMV in order to get their ID. Okay? So let's see what else here. Um, okay, so that's it for the proof of residence or proof of ID. Proof of residence, that's on the left side of that thing. Okay, so that's for when they have to register either on election day or uh, in the clerk's office. I'm just going to go over this real quick here. Um, is this in there? See registration. This is the EL131. El it's the uh, registration application. The last one. Okay. Box number one, all those boxes in there, are, I say, section one, all the boxes need to be checked off. If not, if there's one that's missing, they cannot register. Section two, uh, the name should uh, coincide with whatever proof of residence they give you. And number three, the only thing that is required in there is their date of birth. It's nice to get the phone number if they'd give it to you. Uh, number four is where they live. Number five is their mailing address, if it's different from where they, where they live. Number six is if they're changing their name, put their full previous name. Or if they're changing their address, put their full previous address. Um, the address is really important because if they are moving from another town within the state of Wisconsin, once this registration is put into the WISVOTE system, it goes out and it looks for, um, to see if they're registered in another town. If they are, then it there'll be a registration alert the next day and the clerk can combine the two records if it's the same person. So it'll pull their registration from one town and bring it to you and all their, all their voting record will be in one place. Number seven is uh, filling out the driver's license, excuse me, driver's license and expiration date uh, or state ID. If they don't have that, then they can give you the uh, last four of the social security number. If they don't have either one of those, then um, they check the third box. And then number eight, they have to check because they're gonna provide you with proof of residence. Number nine, the voter signs and dates it. Number 10 is if they, if somebody has to assist them um, filling out this paperwork, they have to sign it and give their address. And then the bottom one is, um, then once they fill this out, then you can ask them for um, a proof of residence. And on your little thing over here, that's proof of ID. It gives you all the different scenarios that you could, or all the different proofs that they can get, that you can get, and they and everything has to be unexpired, um, according to this. The driver's license has to be if they're using their driver's license. Oh, and that's one more thing: the driver's license, the social security card, or the state ID. You're not allowed to ask them to give it to you if they're if they're going to use it for proof of residence. They can offer it to you, but you can't ask for it. Don't, I don't know why, but that's the way it is. Um, also, so it'd be good to have this proof of residence with your registration desk. Also, there's pictured ones too. I think that's, I don't know, if, do you have that, Lynn? I think it's, I think they do. So anyway, these are acceptable proofs of, of, of residence. Okay. Um, oh, and also proof of residence, uh, let's see, something issued by the unit of government. That could be a fishing license, a vehicle registration, food stamps, Medicare notices, 
Social Security benefit statements, um, billing statements from a governmental entity, et cetera, et cetera. So there's quite a few things that they can use. That list that I just read off is, I don't, I didn't have that in the paperwork because this is an older list and it's probably been updated. So I'm trying to get a hold of a new one and then I can send it to everybody so they know what kind of governmental um, paperwork they can use as proof of residence. So then, Oh, uh, military and permanent overseas voters do not have to provide proof of residence. They're the only ones. There's a question, Patty. Oh, Barb. Yeah, every time there's a presidential election. It changes, or no, every time there's a, a federal general election in November, it changes. So the prior, the prior one was, it used to say 28, or, yeah, 2018 yeah. on here. I think it was November 6th of 2018. Then we had one in November, we had a federal election in November, so now it's 2020. So they could, people could be driving around with an expired driver's license. It's happened, yep. <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah, but when they register, it can't be expired. If they're, if they're using their driver's license or their state ID, it cannot be expired. Okay, the, the poll worker that's accepting the registration, um, fill out down here, circle what they've used, uh, sign it, and you can fill in some of the stuff later. Okay, now they've registered. Now, the, now they have to, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So Electronic repeat verification. Yes, that's, that's legal now. So the question was, can the documents be provided? Electronically. Electronically. Yeah. And it's, yes, yes, you can. Yes. Um, you don't have to. That's not required. If you're going to do that, I would suggest asking the voter if it's okay to make a copy of whatever they're using for proof of residence. You don't have to. It's up to you. The only reason I asked is because you said you can't ask them for the driver's license, but if you needed a copy of it to prove something. Well, then they could, um, most people supply the, the driver's license yeah. for proof of residence, but um, they don't have to. They could use something else. Because they're, they may have moved and their driver's license is not updated yet. No, but what if they, you know, like if they've changed and then we have to, like I sent her, how do I show her that they're without proof of it? Just put it on the application. I usually don't have I know, I like to have a copy of everything. Yeah, that's up to your clerk if your clerk wants you. But just make sure you ask the voter, can I make a copy of your proof of residence? You know, just, you don't want to tick them off. <laughs> um, Okay. I, can I okay. add one thing about, I, I don't know if there's any other townships that have a lot, we have a lot of tribal IDs and you can use a tribal ID to register, um, but you, those people need to provide the last four of their social security number because they, a lot of people that provide the tribal ID do not have a driver's license. So they're using that, but you need one or the other. So that's, I think Bass Lake might have a lot of tribal IDs as well. I don't know if Erica's oh, here. I see. I didn't know that. And um, I usually get their tri the tribal number is what I write down. Yeah, we have a, a lot of people that don't have a driver's license. It's just the tribal ID. But because you either need the driver's license or the social security number, just make sure if you are doing something like that, that you get the social security number if, you, if they don't have the driver's license. Okay, so once they're all done, they're all registered. Now you have to ask them for proof of identification, just like they walked in the door. If they don't use their driver's license for their proof of residence, because they, for some reason, but they still have to show that as proof of identification or else they can't vote. 
So if they're unwilling or unable to show a proof of identification, once they're all registered, they can vote for provisionally. And then they have to come in by Friday and show their proof of identification. Make sense? Um, okay, so once everybody's, there, now they're all registered, the, um, then you're gonna get a number from the check-in desk. You're gonna assign that to the, write that number on the voter ID number on the supplemental list, poll list here. You're gonna put their name on here. Uh, you're gonna have them sign the supplemental poll list. If they're changing their name or their address, because they and they have to re-register they don't go back and sign the original poll list they only sign the supplemental poll list okay and then of course you put their address on here i made a bigger one because the one that that the commission sends us is so you can hardly get any information on there i don't have a copy of that with with in the stuff here but you can make it make your own and make it bigger so there's more room to write their address and name and address so once that's all done, then you give them their card and they go to wherever, they either go to pick up a ballot or they um, go to a machine, however it's gonna work in your municipality and they vote. And that's it. Easy peasy. <laughs> Does that all make sense? Did they go through it too quick? Zoom people? No, I guess they're okay. With it. Yeah. The the cards or whatever they are. Um, yeah, because they hand these in. They 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 have to give you the card in order to get a ballot or to work to vote on the machine, and then you can reuse them. Yeah, I I just made these up because I just like I say I just found out about these, and the only reason I knew is because is because I was reading up on how you what things you can discard and on that was serial number cards. So I called the election commission, asked them what it was and they said, she told me, and I said, well, could you have to? And they said, yes. Or she said, no, I don't know for sure, but she looked it up and it's in the statute. So you are required to give them a card and do this process. And you, the card thing, at one point in the past with us, we just had blank like laminated cards and we wrote the number. It's because that's their unique voter ID for the day. So we had like dry erase markers. And then after they signed the poll books, one worker would write, you know, number one, hand it. So then we just reused those cards. But we also went and got like 2000 cards made up and laminated because, but it's kind of a pain because people do walk out with them. So it was actually kind of nice when we had the laminated ones and we could just write on there. But that doesn't help you keep track of it at the end of the day because those numbers get, you know, smeared off. So yeah. having a set that is yours permanently is very helpful yeah, to and, reconcile your numbers at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah, when you're reconciling the inspector statement, it, it's possible that somebody could have come in, registered or registered to vote, um, or checked in to vote, they got a number, they didn't want to wait and they walked out. Yep, we have had that happen. <laughs> so your, your count will be off on the, at the end of the day. And then you can go back and say, oh, number 52 didn't vote. Yep. And the card's missing, so now you know what happened. We had that situation um, two years ago and we couldn't find out what was wrong. And if we would have had these cards, we would have known for sure. So it's a really good they idea. They are very helpful. Um, the election commission did give me a, um, four reasons why you should have that. Um, uh, one of them is a, uh, prevention against voter fraud, uh, good, good record keeping, Reconciliation at the end. Um, I can send I can send this to you guys if you want a copy of it. It's, it all makes sense because I asked her why why do we, do we have to do this and this, they gave us some really good reasons. Instead of write, reading them all off now, I can send you copies of that. So that is it in a nutshell. Yeah. The DMV made you give a certified really? one? Yeah. <gasps> Whoa. So that's the question I have with those. Yeah. 
that I didn't know. So that's not free. <laughs> yeah. So did really? you say what's with the free then? What's what's well, you yeah. might have to. I'm saying right. Listed in their proof of birth certificate. Oh. But that's what they required. Yes. We should look into that and yes. let you guys know. <laughs> yes. Okay. So that could be different than for the, the free ID. We'll, we'll look into it and find out just because. You know, good. even on the form that they fill, it doesn't say that it has to be certified. Oh, for if you're getting a, a, a driver's license or renewing or something. No, not a new one. To get the the, the real ID. The, to get the free get the free ID. No, the the real ID that they call it now. The. Oh, the real driver's license. Yeah. Oh. Well, I think if you're getting a free I was ID, say, so it could be different for the that's free different. ID. Yeah, hopefully, but we'll we'll call and check. Just yeah, I don't I don't think so. Hey, yes. That's a lot of extra work. We actually did that a couple times during these crazy COVID elections, and that was helpful. I mean, it was an extra step, but then when we were reconciling poll books, we were able to go, oh, this voter number is on this page. So, But by you, handing out the cards, that's what eliminates that. Uh, for the people who are in Zoom, um, one town writes their people what do you say you write you write their name down on a separate piece of paper not their name just the the voter number the voter number yep. on a separate piece of paper okay and the page that that voter number is yeah. on in the poll book it is an extra step but we've done it for I the mean, big elections i mean if you want to do that but this is this is a statute handing out these serial card the voter number card they call them serial number cards you have to do that and that's going to coincide with what's in the poll book. Right. So, you know, if you, if I come in and I vote and I'm number 40, well, number 40 is going to be next to my name. So if you want to continue writing them down on a piece of paper, just, yeah, go right ahead. Very yeah. I'll admit that is very helpful. Yeah. Whatever ha makes you happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's next? Oh, election night. Uh, after Closing the, the election. Is that where we are, Linda? Are, are you assigning one of those serial cards to the absentee ballots as well? Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Like what we do when we. We'll count out how many ballots we're about to process or you know put in the books. And if we have like say 50, then we just one through 50, we get those cards out of circulation. So the question was if we use those cards for absentee ballots for the Zoom people. And we do at the town of Hayward. We just get them out of circulation. So then then that like if we do them ahead of time, then voter 51 would start election day. Okay. Okay. Um, inspector statement. We'll go over that first. Okay. The inspector statement, the first, first section, you can fill at any time with your name and um, your don't town have name. A handout for this. Do we, Patty? I don't think we got a, we a handout. Oh, you didn't send one? Oh, nope, I'm I don't sorry. Think we got one in. Here's the inspector. Well, I thought you got one of those, but um, you've all seen them. 
right? Okay, so the first section is you, know, you put your ward and your, your town of and et cetera, et cetera. The second section, there's um, voter unit number. That is the number that's on your, your actual voting machine. The touch screen has it on the top. So I think it's four or five digits long. The ice machine has it uh, right behind. There's a little white tab. It's got a serial number back there. And then there's um, some barcoding underneath it. Ours is VEB, and then there's uh, three, six, eight digits after that. That goes in the unit number. So the next thing is the memory device. That uh, the remember device serial number, that's the number that's on your voting, your memory card. The ICE gets two cards, so you're gonna have to add a, another line on here um, to put the two different numbers. The touch screen only has one, so that cartridge it puts in the back of the machine gets on, puts, is put on here. The tamper um, evidence seal number is only for this seal that you use to seal up your memory card or your cartridge. And of course, there'll be two seals for the ICE in the ICX, I would imagine. I don't know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I know the ICE does. So you have to add another line to put the two serial numbers, seal numbers. These numbers, like I told you before, could be um, put on the inspector statement, or you can have a separate voting log, however you want to do it, as long as they're, um, as long as they're on the log somewhere. Also on the ICE machine, there's, there's five different places where you have to put uh, a seal. There's the, the two memory devices, the ballot box door, the printer door, and the auxiliary bin door. I, the touch screen, there's only, I think there's three, right? Yep. Three. The memory card, the printer, and what's the other one? Well, you guys oh, know. Oh, the polls. Polls open and closed. The polls open and closed. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So the next section is where you put your number of voters. So if you had 259 voters come in, that should be the last voter that checked in on your poll list. You also have to know the, the last page of, your, of that last voter too, because that goes on another form the clerk has. So you put 249 there, total number of election day registrations is the next section. The number of absentee voters, the number of provisional ballots, most people won't have any of those. Um, it happens though. The total ballots cast. Okay, the total total ballots cast should be the number of voters that came in. So if 249 voters came in, you should have 249 ballots that were cast. If you're short, it's probably somebody that walked out. And that's when these little cards come in handy. You can find out who, who walked out. If it's over, you're in big trouble. Problem. <laughs> You have a problem, and I don't know how to fix it. You'd have to go back over all your counting and find out um, what happened. I or guess if you skipped a number, hide under the table and cry because it's gonna yeah. be a lot of work. You may have skipped. <laughs> you may have skipped a number. You know, if you you circled number fifty two and fifty three, and you really didn't give a fifty three to anybody. That's, that could be it. Say, that's when all of your documentation, circling, writing, giving out cards, it all comes into play because that's when you yeah. backtrack and try to find the error. Okay, so then at the bottom here, it says number of, so the number of hand counted ballots, if you have any, the number of optical scan, which would be your tabulator, or the number of the touch screen. So the hand ballots in the machine count should be the no total number of voters. So it balances. The next section is uh, sign, let's see, signature of election inspectors. Everybody's got a sign. If you've got seven people working that day, just put them on another piece of paper. Um, or if you have five or whatever, but they, everybody has to sign. I was told in one of the webinars that they, they said only three need to sign, but that's not true. Everybody that works that day has to sign this inspector statement. Chief inspector signs at the bottom. If you have two chief inspectors that day, they both sign at the bottom. And then anything unusual that Bryn already went over goes on this incident log. 
um, some some municipalities write down the date, the time they open their elections, which isn't necessary. But if you want to put that in, that's fine. Your seal logs can go on there. Like I said, um, any any apps, any ballots that were um, objected to, any absentee objected ballots would go on here too. And there's a whole list. Your clerk will have this. There's a whole list of th reasons what what would why you wrote something in the inspector statement on the incident log so you can read this over during election day when it's really boring <laughs> anybody have a no nobody has no we don't have nobody in Sawyer county has primary right right okay oh you found i found one online oh good okay what else what am I, I was just going to say that we were at a training, or I was recently, and a different clerk had redone their entire um, inspector statement. So Patty and I were looking at ways to redo it, and we might yet. If we do, we'll send it out to you, because they had like, you know, so you're not attaching all these extra sheets of paper with all your serial numbers and signatures of poll workers. So if and you can create your own too, just as long as it has that information. I, I thought it was something standard from the state. I didn't know you could redo it. So as a clerk, if you want to redo the inspector statement, just make sure that it has all of that and then add the additional space. Okay, <laughs> we'll do it and send it out. <laughs> I'll be going to steal it from Madison. <laughs> there's if you have any it. suggestions that you want things added yeah. to it, let um, us know, because I think we will try to redo let it. Let Bryn know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She'll do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I was told, you know, that little box that says check box if no incidents are recorded, that you oh, should yeah. never check that box because I something have. always happens. <laughs> I know. I've checked it, but that's what I they have, tell us because the nothing state. happened, <laughs> especially on these primaries when there's nothing going on. So, but the election commission said... There should never be, this should never be empty. Yeah. <laughs> but it is. Okay. So then once you got the inspector statement all done, then you're going to close, you're going to close your polls. Well, you might close your polls beforehand. Um, just follow your, whatever's in your manual, follow the instructions on how to close your polls on your machine. When you, Print, oh, forgot something. Way at the beginning, when you open your polls, a zero report will print out. Everybody has to sign it, except for the clerk. All poll workers have to sign that, and you want to look to make sure that everything, there's zeros next to everybody's name, okay? Now, at the end of the night, you're going to print the total, uh, rep uh, the total uh, pages. And um everybody has to sign those too and you want to print enough for everybody there's one for the your municipal clerk there's one for the county clerk and there's one for each school so for me i have two school districts that um, vote in hunter so we will have one for winter one for hayward one for the county one for me everybody has to sign all the ta all the, the total tapes okay so then, Patty, that's just everybody who's still there in case there's split shifts. Is that correct? Yeah, everybody who's still there. I mean, yeah, obviously, yeah. Okay, then you remove your ballots from the ballot box. Um, and then you, oh boy, you have to uh, determine if there's write ins, you have to determine which ones are going to be um, counted by hand. Um, the write-ins, you're going to have to have your clerk explain all that to you because it's very, very confusing on who, who has, whose write-in is counted and who isn't. Um, there are samples, and I'll go over those in a little while. But anyway, so if you, you have two sets of tally sheets, so there's a person here and a person here with their tally sheets, and one person in front of them, and they're going to read off off that total tape, they'll read the number of votes for each person, each candidate, and then you put that on the tally sheet. If you have to count anything by hand, then you're going to do this the little tick, 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 check, tick, 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 check thing. You have the, the one person in front of you will read off, off the ballot, so-and-so, 
and then you put the check mark next to their name. And you do that all the way until all the, all the hand counted ones are done. And then, um, yeah, the, the write-ins, the election commission said that there's no such thing as scattering. Well, I don't know how you count Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. It's a scattering to me. I did find out something about that this week. Um, you only have to count, well, you, you tick mark the scattering, but you don't have to write the names down unless they're a registered write-in, then you keep track of those. But yeah. if there's nobody on the ballot, then you count Mickey Mouse as a, reg as a write-in. So in District 12, anyone who has District 12, they're going to be counting those write-ins. Okay, there you go. Mickey Mouse gets counted. Mm -hmm. Donald Duck, you know, if there's nobody else on the, on the ticket. no name on the ticket. No, no ballot candidates is Correct. what you're saying, right? Okay. Um, if, if there's a write-in that didn't get counted and a ballot candidate did get counted, you're going to have to adjust your tape. And like I say, you're going to have to go over this write in stuff because it's very confusing. Uh, all right, so now you got all your, your handwritten, your hand counted ballots on the tally sheet. You got your machine totals on your, your tally sheet. Each uh, poll worker will add up separately and then, then make sure that you agree. So you add them up separately and then compare and make sure that you agree. If you don't, then you have to go back through and find out why you're off on your count. Um, then you will enter all the counts on the election uh, night call-in sheet and fax it into the county. And that is on the sheet that, I, that you got, that you have in your, your work there. If you don't have a uh, fax machine, then you call it in. But do not leave the poll place and, or the town hall until the county calls you back and says that they got your fax. Now, when you put all your stuff together, the only thing that goes in the paper in, into the ballot bag are your ballots. Nothing else goes in the ballot bag. I had one gal that kept insisting on putting stuff in there. Only ballots go in the ballot bag. Um, and all the other materials are listed on here. They go to, to the county. Uh, the the um, print off from the machines, those tapes get ta stapled to the front of the tally sheets and they'll go to the county um, and keep the clerk, the municipal clerk also gets a copy of all of this stuff. The poll book, the only one that goes to the county is the one that's um, signed. The other one that's not signed is um, stays with the, the municipal clerk. And I just thought of something else that was really important. <laughs> it went right out of my head. Um, the provisional documentation, provisional ballots are not due until the following Monday because, because you're giving people time to come back and show their proof of identification. So their ballot will count. And that was it, I guess. Oh, I think it was something on the inspector statement. Um, and while she's thinking of that, because of all the issues we had in the, in the 2020 general election, I'm going to require that the municipal clerk of each municipality come in to pick up their materials and drop them off. Because we had a lot, I spent hours and hours on records requests. And I'm just gonna maintain, that's the chain of custody we, we shouldn't be having our neighbor or whatever because they're going to town and we live far away. We, we can't do that anymore just because of all those requests we had with general election. Sorry about that, but we learned our lesson. Can you put the inspector statement back up? Sure. I missed a spot in the inspector statement here. You didn't catch me. Well, while she's looking for it, there's a section here. It's the third one down. Um, the seal number that you use to 
seal your um, memory card or your cartridge, the chief inspector has to verify that number that's, that's on your log. So whatever number that you've put on that memory device, is on your log and they initial it. At the end of the night, they look again to make sure that that's the same serial number that's on the memory device um, lock. And then they initial it again. Uh, then it says, it says to record the tamper's uh, evidence seal number used in the ballot bag. Well, we don't use those anymore. So I just been writing the ballot bag number on that section. Cause there's, there are no seals cause it, it just, I found the forms, Patty, if you need to. Oh, yeah, that's, it says where it says, um, oh, yeah. this section to be completed by chief inspector. Okay, I forgot that part. That's all I have. Linda, do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I ask them if I if they want one and they say no. I just send them the tally sheet with a copy of the, with the with the tape to see, uh, stapled to it. So that question, if you would repeat the question too. Except for the um, the ballots, they have to go to them. That the question but, was what oh, what, what do you send to the, what poll book do you send to the school? And I say I don't send a poll book to the school. And they're fine You've with that. You've made a copy of our signed poll. No. Yes, the signed poll book and sent to the school. And then winter, because we have like three people that vote there. I have two. <laughs> we, they want a copy of the signed pages from our voters. Yeah, that's right. So that's right. That's, yeah. I've, I've that's, just, at the end of the name. night, I just stick our signed poll book in the copy machine and run one copy of it. Yeah. And that goes to the Hayward schools for us. And then winter schools, because we have so few, they just want a copy of like the three pages where voters yeah. signed. Yeah, I have two for winter and I do make a copy of that poll page. But Hayward, I don't make a copy of the poll book. I've never asked for one. So. And if they do, well, of course, I can make a copy, but um, yeah. Do you have more than one school district, I suppose? Two. What do you do? <gasps> the, the whole poll, poll book? Okay. Yeah, that I have those too. <laughs> I, I don't fill those out either. <laughs> I used to. I have about 500 of those now. <laughs> <laughs> Use them for scratch paper. Yep. Has the, I got a Lynn, question for Lynn. Has a, has a school ever come in and requesting a copy of the poll book from like me cause, that I don't give them a copy? Nope, no ma'am, they have not. In fact, only one school I think Hayward has anything dropped off here. I don't think I see any of the other school districts. The winter I give the co that one page, but Hayward, I don't. I know one, one uh, town, used to have their, um, the voter come in and sign both poll books, but that's not necessary. They just have to sign one poll book. And that's the one that goes to the county. Okay. I'm asking the Zoom participants if they have any questions. Any more questions? Don't forget your number cards. Shelly? When they do the mail in, for say like they mail it on Monday, how long after the election or is it have to be in your hands by 8 p.m.? It now has to be in our hands by 8 p.m. on election she day. Want, she so, wanted to know about the absentee ballots coming in. Um, they have to, yes, they have to be in our hands by 8 o'clock on election night. Anything yeah. comes in later, too late. Good yes. question. <laughs> no, I made these up. 
one easy way to do that, I think, might be to get a box of business cards that are pre-perforated. Could you do those and then just that way you don't have to cut everything? They're all the same yeah. size. We had just had yeah, advanced printing. But these are going to be already, <laughs> already numbered and I'll just reuse them. Yeah, so we, uh, we've been but through so many. But that's a good idea. Yeah. But we finally just had advanced printing make us up like 2,000 and laminate them. And then, well, we also have separate ones for various wards too, because those elections are confusing. That's because you're rich. We're rich. <laughs> <laughs> Patty and Bryn. Yes. We have one Zoom question. What are the masking requirements at the polling stations at this point in time? Up um, to the... the election commission says that you can request that your poll workers wear masks. The people that come in to vote, you can't make them wear a mask. No. You could ask, I mean, you can ask, we have a, a sanitation uh, station right when they walk in and we always ask them to sanitize their hands. And of course we have the plexiglass still down in front of the gals, um, the check-in gals and the registration desk. So you only have control over your poll workers, not. Yeah, we, we still have quite a few pens left from when the state sent us like 1,100 pens. Um, I, for the people that are getting the ice machine, I tested those pens to see if they will work if you fill in the circle, and they do work. Uh, because the command central said that you should have like a felt tip pen, but the ones that the state sent us, if they make sure they fill it in, it will go through the machine without a problem and then they can just keep the pen. Because we have tons of them yet. <laughs> so do we. Now that's another thing, when, when they come in now, especially with, like with me and anybody that's got the new machines, and make sure that you tell them, just fill that circle in all the way. Do not put a check mark, do not put an X, do not put a dot, fill it in. And please, please don't overvote. <laughs> or you won't, it won't count. And don't put in Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. <laughs> so there you are. Yeah. Yes, it does. However, you got to check to see if there's a write in on there and if that write in is supposed to be counted. And if it does, then the ballot con, the, the other two don't get counted. So you have to determine if it was counted. You guys ask great questions. Ladies, you two did a great job presenting. Ah, shucks. <laughs> And, and, and for everybody here, I want to thank you for coming and for attending in Zoom. We've learned some lessons, too. I, for one, learned uh, about the orientation on the handout. I didn't realize it wasn't a few of those were still at the wrong orientation, so they couldn't see them. They were sideways. And I think numbering our pages so that Patty or whoever's presenting can just say page six, and I can go to page six. That'll make it easier than trying to say, what's the head? What's the title of that page? So we've learned a lot on our first training. So we will continue to improve. But boy, ladies, I can't tell you how much we appreciate this of you. If anybody wants to do a presentation, feel free. Feel free. <laughs> I, think, I think there should be a presentation on the, um, on the county and write-ins because it's very, that very is, confusing. That, yeah, and that's um, changed. Just for an example, one of the samples they sent here this is for a village trustee and it says vote for no more than two. Well, the person voted for the two ballot candidates and they did a write-in. The write-in was a registered write-in. So that person, the, the write-in was counted and the two ballot candidates weren't. So you have to find out which is which. There's another one where um, Tom Supervise says vote for three. Well, they voted for two can ballot candidates. They wrote in two names. One was registered, one was not. The two write-ins were counted and the other two were not, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't a registered write-in. 
So it's just a very, very confusing. They considered they took more effort in writing than yeah, doing this. But you know, I don't know. I don't understand if they're if they're not registered, why should they be counted? But that's me. Um, there's another instance if a person is deceased um, and they get they get a vote anyway. Of course, that gets thrown out, and the write-ins get uh, and, um, the write-ins get counted instead. So, I don't know your clerks might want to go over this with you, or maybe we should have another training session on this because it's it's very very confusing. We'll investigate that part. Um, and there was just one last question from Zoom: What do you do with an absentee ballot that comes in the mail after the election? I just put it with my in my folder with or my envelope with all the other stuff. Yep. Uh, now the WIS vote, there used to be a screen to go in and enter it that it came in later. I don't know if they still do that. I think they discontinue that. Otherwise, just keep it with your with all your work and annotate that it was it came in late. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you said we also have a lot of uh, mail-in. That mail-in vote that came in gets counted. What if the person you have their oh, if they if they passed away, that happened to me. I have instructions on that. Um, there's a way to go in to the WISP vote, and you got to do some stuff. I I'll I'll get the instruction. It's still, it's still no, it depends on when the person voted and when the person died and unfortunately it is kind of left up to the clerk to determine so i've ha i've had it happen where someone voted and that means i received their ballot it, it, that should have been a counted ballot and then i believe they died like right before election day and when i talked to the state they said that vote counts because what they were alive that they voted you know, it, it's no different than if they would have come in on election day, cast their vote, and died right afterwards. That vote would have counted. Well, right. I had I had somebody come in. The wife came in with the with her husband's um, ballot. He did vote, and I called the elections. And she came in. It hadn't been sent to me. She just dropped it off, and um, I called, and they said that you don't have to count that one. See, and, so, and at different trainings, I don't know. I think you and I were at a training, and they said. It's kind of unfortunately left up to the clerk to make that determination because you would have more of the details, you know, so yeah, I it's not just a blanket. Yes, it always counts or no, you never count it. Right. Right. So that's, I suppose, different. Yeah. Then if it's mailed in, that's yeah. different. Yeah. I mean, she actually brought it in. You guys, this is Liz. You, you guys, Hi. that needs more clarification. We, I've been through this with the Wisconsin Elections Commission also. They told us at a training that you could take a dead voter. Later, we found in the statutes that you can't. So we're, we're, that needs to be clarified. I don't think we should decide that you, it's not up to the clerk. It's in the statutes. I mean, I, a dead person can investigate that. I think so, yeah. The votes are counted on election day. They're counted on election day. If the person's dead, then they can't vote. It has to be challenged. Someone could challenge it. Right. Yeah. Cool. So we'll check into that one more. Well, if they haven't sent it back, then that's no, no biggie. I mean, there's no right. problem. It's just when it's already in house is the question, right, Liz? Yes. Um, okay. If you know they died, then you're the clerk and you're, I'm there on election day. I stay for the whole thing. If I know someone died and, they, and my poll workers are out there discussing it and their ballot came in, we don't count that. They're not ineligible. They're ineligible, uh, ineligible to vote then, they're dead. Well, we'll, let, we'll but, get it straightened yeah. out. Yeah, I think we should look into it just to prove it one way or we the will. other. Okay. Yeah, because there is a way, um, like I say, I, I do my own WIS vote input and um, they instructed me on how to go in and show that the person had deceased, um, the right. absentee then got wiped off. But it wasn't mailed, it was, it was brought to me, so. Okay.
Okay, I think we're all set. You guys, make sure you turn this in yourself to your training. It's uh, period 2024-25 election term. Yes, it's ahead, but that is what Allison Coakley has approved for us. So uh, keep this and make sure you turn it in. That means so you're stuck working elections for a long time. <laughs> yeah, so, th so this, is, this is the two hours for the poll workers. You're, unless your clerk wants you to do more training, this is really pretty much done you're for you. You're good for a long time. And the clerks, you got your two hours in. For 24 and five. 24 and five. Okay, I'm gonna sign off Zoom. Thanks all.